My name is Dr. Kalama Okaina Niheu, and it's my great honor to welcome all of our guests from here in Kapai Aina, as well as across the world, and to especially welcome our, our um, wonderful guest, Dr. Paul Farmer. And in the tradition of our people, the Kanakamoli of Hawaii, I would like to do an oli to help ground us, to help center us, and to help uh, remind ourselves uh, to bring in the ike uh, of our people and our ancestors so that we can learn and be open to join together in the hopes that conversations such as these will allow us to be bigger, better, and stronger. E mai kaike mai luna mai ye Una hamia una no yu Una mele E humai E humai E humai Humai kai ke mai luna mai ye Una mea una no yu Una mele Homei E Homei E Homei E Homei Kai ke mai luna mai ye Una mea una no yu Una mele homei 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 Thank you, Clark. Thank you. Uh, my name is Seiji Amara. Uh, thank you, Kalama Okaina, for the Oli. We in Hawaii should acknowledge that we are on Kapaiaina, land, ocean, and air that originally belonged to the Kanaka Maoli people. For anybody joining us today, I think that Paul Farmer needs no introduction. Instead of listing all his titles and accomplishments, I'd like to pose a question. Why does Paul Farmer visit us in Hawaii? I suggest that the answer is that he wants to help us build a social movement for health here in Hawaii and the Pacific. Dr. Farmer last visited us in 2007. My friend Gregory Mascarinic and I were hoping that his visit, his visit then would have kicked off a social movement for health here. While there have been some positive developments, and Dr. Kalama Okaina Niheu will tell us about some of those, we need to do more. Dr. Farmer is joining us tonight to give us another chance. He wants us to join him in the practice of social medicine. If you read AIDS and Accusation, you'll find chapters about the colonial history of Haiti. If you read Fevers, Fuse, and Diamonds, you will find chapters about West African colonial history. His message is that you need to understand the large scale social and historical forces in order to understand why the poor are so sick. Moreover, Dr. Farmer addresses the deep inequalities that lead to medical deserts by bringing medicine and medical education to where there is none. By demonstrating that it can be done, he helps us overcome the prevailing pessimistic view that little can be done for the poor. I ask those of you joining us today to ask yourselves how you can apply Dr. Farmer's message to our work here in Hawaii and the Pacific. Thank you. And now uh, some remarks by Dr. Paul Farmer. Thank you, Seiji. Um, as, you, uh, as you can imagine, I feel uh, First of all, uh, you know, very grateful to be invited back um, and a little intimidated uh, by the 
uh, introduction um, and, and also very grateful for Kalama's uh, centering of us and her work, of course, in general, especially over the last couple of years fighting COVID. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I wish I were with you. I'm in um, right near Volcano National Park with Volcano National Park in Rwanda. And this is a, a maybe a, it's a picture that, a photograph that centers me. Um, um, the, the sun isn't up yet, but I will, I can see already the, this hospital, which is a public hospital built in a region of Rwanda that had no hospital. Um, there, and it was the last district of 30 uh, to have one. And um, I, I even hope you can see the, uh, get a feel for uh, the region, but also the love that we attempted to uh, put into this hospital in building it um, for the people of an underserved region in collaboration with the health authorities here. And I wanna talk um, not about health policy in Hawaii because I would be out of my depth and we have other experts here, but about ways of pushing forward pragmatic solidarity focused on uh, what we hear uh, again and again, and, and this is true of nurses, physicians, any frontline worker, social worker, anyone who attends um, uh, carefully to what is said or pays reverent attention to it. Uh, the material privations, the history of colonial rule and its legacy on this continent um, have meant uh, very practically a lack of the staff, the stuff, the space, the systems and the support that you need uh, to attend to illness or prevent it. And, and I will go back again and again, as, as Seiji uh, has asked me, uh, two policy questions and how social justice activism might help move forward uh, towards a better uh, tomorrow. Next slide, please. And then I, I also wanna thank my colleague who, uh, Ishan, who got up early. Um, I consider myself still not to be uh, a, a very informed person on, on way too many topics, uh, but my first uh, teacher uh, in many ways outside of a university was in the year between college and medical school uh, when I ended up in a squatter settlement in rural Haiti. This is, uh, I know this isn't 1983 because there were no uh, cement buildings there. And I didn't even know that there were squatter settlements uh, in rural areas. It was something that as a, a 23 year old, I associated with urban uh, areas. But if you look at this picture and some of you have been uh, to Central Haiti, it looks very different now, this area, you'll see that uh, in the background is a body of water. And uh, that is not a natural lake, but a hydroelectric dam, a reservoir uh, that uh, flooded a valley of the, the, the most fertile valley of, uh, in the region and sent uh, not only water, but later electricity off uh, to the capital city. And in these hills uh, were my, I found out my teachers, uh, some of them have, have passed away, uh, but uh, they're still my teachers and, and my friends as are their children and now grandchildren. And, and this is where uh, I learned a lot of hard lessons um, uh, and, and saw uh, very few victories for a long uh, time and uh, started to learn why, you know, and the question asked in the title is who lives and who dies. And I, I think that uh, these are often, not often mysteries. Certainly they didn't seem like mysteries to the people who lived here and told me in clear, no, no uncertain terms, how they had been moved from what they called decent poverty into destitution. Uh, and with destitution and without it, of course, uh, comes sickness, disease, uh, illness, injury. Next slide, please. And I want to uh, also ask for forgiveness for uh, mixing up this with a, you know, a more medical uh, lecture, but this is a very modest um, example. Um, we began seeing HIV uh, which uh, in, in rural Haiti in the 1980s. Um, Sage, you mentioned uh, uh, my, a book I wrote, um, AIDS and Accusation, which is about how racism plays a role 
in uh, transnational uh, spread of uh, pathogens, but other things as well, as you mentioned, colonial history. But uh, by the time we started seeing patients usually coming back from the capital city uh, to uh, these villages, uh, they were often coming home to die. And we had seen this before with other illnesses. Um, again, that didn't mean that they didn't seek care elsewhere uh, outside of what we would call a clinical desert. They had, and whether it was breast cancer or tuberculosis, uh, people were going on these long and often desperate uh, uh, quests for care. And, uh, and, and so we built there uh, along with many partners uh, a small uh, hospital, first a clinic, and started uh, seeing a pattern that would later be well documented around the world. First of all, these are just 200 uh, patients uh, who, who showed up. And, and when you open the doors of a clinic and remove uh, user fees and other impediments of neoliberal thinking, uh, you'll see every kind of pathology. And I'll, I'll turn a little bit later to cancer here in Rwanda and, and, and to the problem we're all facing now, which is COVID. But here we just, uh, we noticed, again, this was a pattern to be repeated uh, and was already going on elsewhere in the world, including American cities and uh, across this continent where I am now, that most of the patients who presented with uh, HIV disease, with documented HIV infections, presented with pulmonary TB, which was then the leading infectious cause of uh, deaths among uh, young adults in the world until it was surpassed a few years later by HIV. And it has now reclaimed that position once again. So we asked ourselves in this era, and, and if I may add a personal uh, note, uh, in 1993 and to 1995, I was myself, uh, as was Dr. Yamato in training, and I was training in infectious disease with an interest in tuberculosis for the reasons that I just mentioned, the burden of disease, the fact that there had been cur curative therapy for, for decades, but the problem was distribution and equity and even uh, reparate, reparative actions to make these therapies available. So we asked ourselves, do we know how to take care of tuberculosis? And thought the, the answer was yes. Um, we had introduced a program that focused in the on the needs of patients, not on the needs of staff, a growing medical and nursing staff. And, uh, and we started talking in terms of what was, what, who were the staff we needed most? Uh, were, were they infectious disease doctors as I was striving to be? Uh, or were community health workers more important? Uh, what was the stuff? Um, was it only uh, drugs like isoniazid, revampin, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide? Or did that include uh, uh, food um, for the food insecure, which proved to be the majority of our patients. Uh, what was the space? Uh, did we want uh, people to be away from their families for long times in an institutional setting? Or could we do better with community-based care? Um, what were the systems? Uh, how did we look for hidden fees and costs that prevented patients from adhering to therapy and reaching cure? And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, and, and we focused on support to the patient. And this again, sometimes meant uh, helping them get from one village to another. I do believe we introduced the term donkey rental fee into the medical literature during this time. Um, and, uh, and we asked ourselves uh, right at the end of this period, 1995, what is our equity plan as new therapies are developed for HIV? And, and I wanna tell that story uh, a little bit. Uh, of course, any images from patients are used uh, with their approval and usually their blessing. Next slide, please. So uh, what we began to see uh, was people returning again, usually from somewhere else in the country um, uh, with uh, both HIV and tuberculosis. Uh, and this is a young man that I met in a public clinic because we were trying to ask ourselves, and I've, I've written a little bit about this with Seiji uh, and others, you know, what, what is the function of a public hospital? Is it not as a safety net? 
Uh, is it not the way that we could ensure uh, access to health for all, which at the time seemed mere, uh, an empty slogan to so many? And this young man uh, had uh, disseminated tuberculosis, HIV, advanced HIV. Uh, and, and it was at the time, of course, that uh, there was a great deal of skepticism uh, expressed on behalf of other people, most of them black and brown people. That is, and you remember, and I'll, 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 I'll bring this up, that it's not possible to treat AIDS in resource poor settings. You don't have the doctors, you don't have the staff stuff space systems necessary to do so. So uh, who lives and who dies depends not only on epidemiology, on whether or not there's prevalent tuberculosis when HIV hits, but it depends all too much on the decisions made by policymakers who then do not themselves face these kind of problems. Uh, the ne uh, next slide, please. So by then, um, we had begun collecting with the help of AIDS activists um, uh, medications that would allow us to take care of people like, please go back one, uh, like, uh, like uh, T. Joseph, which is uh, what was what he asked us to call him. And uh, it's not as if it were some miracle. Um, it was merely, it's not as if there's a different physiology for rural Haitians than, you know, the men and women I was seeing in Boston at a time uh, when uh, HIV was also the leading infectious killer of young adults in the United States. Um, but rather uh, having not only a system of delivery of care, but a commitment to reversing the inequalities that made it seem so unlikely, again, uh, especially to certain policymakers, so unlikely that this would ever reach uh, rural Haiti to say nothing of the continent that was clearly the most effective, and that's this one. Next slide. And I, I, won't, I won't spend a lot of time on, on, this, uh, on this slide. Um, this is also, again, T. Joseph now at home, um, uh, but this is, was not a small project at the time. And my Haitian colleagues uh, who term uh, community health workers accompaniateurs, people who accompany, um, uh, are the ones, of course, who rolled this project out through public hospitals, which had been fallen into uh, were basically not functional across this part of Haiti. And this is not a small part of Haiti. It goes from the Dominican border all the way to the coast on the West. Uh, and uh, there are many, there are millions of people who live there. Um, and so we began using the same approach that we had with tuberculosis, which we knew worked, which was to focus on community health workers, on making the stuff available, in this case, antiretroviral therapy, and to providing the support uh, to the families, but especially the patients and even staff uh, with, remark, with remarks, uh, sorry, with results um, that we began to feel not only on the level of uh, the population seeing, uh, eventually seeing a rapid, not a rapid, but a significant decline in the prevalence of HIV, um, but also a, a very marked uh, improvement of morale among our staff and, and coworkers who were all Haitian, of course. And that included not only the community health workers who shared the social conditions of the patients, but the nurses, the physicians, the managers. Um, and again, I use this jargon, strength in health systems. And I know this is a relevant question in Hawaii as well. Why have we divested so much from our public health delivery systems? And also why have we ever tried and have we ever succeeded at continuing disease control uh, to the exclusion of caring for patients? And this is a logic uh, which lives on to this day that's rooted very strongly in colonial medicine, which again hit Haiti much earlier uh, during much of colonial medicine, there was none at all. But surprisingly, uh, it gathered force in the late 19th century. And as I was able to discuss in my remarks yesterday, uh, this was the time of significant scientific advancement in Europe and North America and some other parts of Asia. Uh, but there was really never any plan to share this bounty uh, with colonial subjects, the majority of whom lived in India uh, worldwide, but all of Africa became colonized not centuries ago, but really at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and 
colonial medicine, I won't go over what I did yesterday, uh, is a, care, uh, a control over care strategy that continues to bedevil us today. And I'd like to show how that played out uh, or is still playing out today. Next slide. Um, so this is another way of putting it. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, this is a, is a, a graph that uh, was uh, made by a gap miner, but as you can see, it bears the imprimatur of uh, the UN, one of the UN uh, affiliates, UN AIDS. Um, and at the time that this great divergence was occurring, uh, there were fairly loud recommendations from self-described authorities that it was not possible to treat AIDS in Africa. And before I go to the next, ART of course means antiretroviral therapy. And before I go uh, to the next slide, I'd just like to say, think about the various health problems that you're facing there. Uh, it may be a COVID, uh, vac a, vac a new COVID vaccine. It may be a new chemotherapeutic agent. It may be the, you know, something, uh, a, a kidney transplant. And indeed, I'm on service here at, at a hospital where all of these questions have come up just in the last uh, 40 days. They come up every day. So when you introduce a new and beneficial uh, technology, whether that be a preventive or a diagnostic or a therapeutic, if you don't have an equity plan, why would we not see this divergence? So even with our weak and uh, weakening health system in the United States, the impact of ART on mortality uh, among Americans or people living uh, in, in what are called the boundaries of the United States, uh, mortality plummeted as it was getting ever worse uh, in other parts of the world. And, and, and of course, I will address in-country variations of what, as well, uh, what many used to call the third world at home, populations within affluent countries who were also being denied the fruits of modern medicine. Next slide, please. So what were some of the things that were said? And I've taken, I've taken the names of the people who had said uh, these things away because this was really conventional wisdom and repeated again and again um, uh, that, uh, you know, that the lack of staff, staff stuff space systems was not a challenge to marshal resources to address these problems, but rather a reason for inaction. Uh, you heard stories about, well, Africans have a different sense of time. They don't have watches. Um, by the way, this, this infuriated my uh, Haitian colleagues and many of our, uh, our patients would become our friends and coworkers as well. Uh, the, the list of excuses for inaction should be familiar to you. But fortunately, next slide, uh, there was uh, uh, a brisk counter response. And here, I just want to imagine what uh, things would be like uh, here and elsewhere, if not for uh, courageous AIDS activists, and particularly in the United States, but uh, also in Haiti and in Africa. This, this picture was taken uh, in Durban, South Africa. Um, I was at that uh, protest myself. And uh, some remarkable things happen. To have the required staff stuff, space systems and support, you need uh, resources. And you know, if you have any sense of history, uh, these, are, uh, these could be called mitigating resources or they could be thought of as long overdue reparations. Um, but without uh, these resources, uh, we'd be living in a very world, a different world today. Um, in the three districts uh, where Partners in Health works with the Rwandan government, the Ministry of Health, um, we haven't seen, I believe in three years, any cases of mother to child transmission of HIV. And I remember when I was a resident, I assumed at the Boston teaching hospitals, I assumed that you know, HIV would be a major killer of American children and it hasn't because of this technology, uh, but healthcare delivery in an equitable manner uh, 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 still remains far too elusive. But this is a story of how activism helped to change policy. Next slide, please. And, and that's how we ended up here. Um, again, this was just to describe it in, in, in more Seiji Yamada-esque terms. This was a community-based uh, effort 
to not just control AIDS with a control over care paradigm, but to take care of people with HIV uh, as, and, and without the usual curse of user fees in settings with no health insurance. Uh, at one point, uh, when we looked a few years ago after the earthquake in, ha in Haiti, which has uh, probably 11 million population, about 60,000 60, families uh, could count on reliable health insurance. And we didn't know any of them. Uh, and and, and uh, even though sometimes they do come to the, the, the hospitals that we've built because they're good hospitals in rural areas, we don't even know how to charge them fees. Um, so the reasons that this was attractive to the Rwandan authorities after the genocide against the Tutsis uh, was uh, because they have, they have and still have a largely rural population. And as happens with war or genocide, uh, these uh, are potent multipliers of epidemic disease and HIV was no exception. And so uh, we were lucky enough to come to Rwanda in 2004, it says 2005, which is when we were sent to uh, first one, then two, and then three of the four districts without any district hospital at all. So our mission was never, you know, a ver a, a, what they call in public health circles, a vertical mission uh, to control or, or treat HIV, but to introduce comprehensive publicly supported healthcare services, including prevention, uh, but focusing on the ill and injured uh, in three of the four uh, districts of Rwanda with no remaining, uh, with no uh, hospitals at all. And, the, and when I say district, I just want the people in, listening in Hawaii to know that sometimes these were three, 400,000 people strong. Uh, these were large populations without access to even primary care. So we use the same model of accompaniment uh, and our Haitian colleagues, when I say we, our Haitian colleagues helped to lead this effort. Um, and it was of course in very rural areas. Uh, but one thing we saw in Rwanda that we uh, did not, had not seen in many of the other places where we worked was a government that made very clear commitments to health equity in explicit terms that when this rollout, and, and again, a rollout not just of HIV care, but of primary healthcare service, when it began, it would be focused on rural people, on the poor. We used a different kind of language, uh, a preferential option for the poor. They didn't use that term. They talked about the bottom quintile. They talked about widows and genocide survivors. So the plan that was developed by the Rwandans, um, including uh, one of, uh, the person who became my closest friend here, uh, the pediatrician Agnes Benaguahu, who helped to write that plan. In this plan, the staff self space systems and social supports were baked right in, as the Americans say. Next slide, please. So we uh, were, again, sent to, to re rebuild facilities. Uh, this is not rocket science. Uh, who would go to uh, uh, an abandoned hospital with, uh, without physicians, without reliable electricity, water, without service? And the answer all over the world is very few. Um, and uh, so rebuilding that, uh, you know, that hospital uh, was not a difficult task, uh, but we also saw the same kind of Lazarus effect uh, in Rwanda that we saw in, in Haiti. Next slide. Um, for example, uh, many, many of our colleagues in Rwanda were skeptical that we would see those kind of transformations. Uh, but my Haitian colleagues and, 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 and others from Partners in Health were not skeptical. And it didn't take long. Again, all you have to do is open the doors, meaning fling them wide open so anyone would come in. And people in desperate circumstances, in this case, uh, uh, this, this, this man's name is John, uh, with both tuberculosis and HIV yet again. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the same, and the impact on the staff uh, uh, was, uh, uh, which again, there was no staff there. So recruiting nurses and physicians to rural areas was very difficult at the time. Um, uh, but when they began seeing results like that, the, the community health workers 
themselves were already living there, and many of them were recruited among the ranks of pe people living with HIV or having survived tuberculosis or some other illness. So they were already there. But the more this happened, the stronger the program became. And let me just give an example that uh, would be the next slide, the, the envy even of a clinical trial. With accompaniment and with strong support from the Ministry of Health and National AIDS Program, uh, we saw uh, results um, uh, among even the sickest. Uh, and these, th these are the first thousand adults. The numbers are even better among children. Um, we did not lose people to follow up because there were community health workers. Uh, and uh, uh, we did not see many defaulters, which is a, probably a bad term. Uh, so we saw survival. And the question for the Rwandans uh, ever, it seemed to me, was, but what do we do on a national scale? Uh, and so, although the models have varied from district to district, the commitment to rolling out these services, linking them to the basic primary care, in other words, health system strengthening, and making this a public good for public health rather than a neoliberal approach to a and making it a commodity to be sold, did get rolled out and quite rapidly. Next slide. So this is at a time when the World Health Organization was, was defining universal access to HIV care. Uh, this is what happened in Rwanda, which is one of the poorer countries. It's less poor now than it was uh, 10 years ago, significantly less poor, but uh, you know, Rwanda met those criteria before any other country did. And again, back to the question of who lives or dies, this is not some great uh, mystery. Next slide. It was an equity focused approach. In fact, when linked to health system strengthening, the Rwandans could reasonably claim uh, whether looking at under five mortality, whether looking at HIV, malaria, TB mortality, whether even looking at maternal mortality to have this, seen the steepest declines in mortality ever documented at any time and any place in human history. And again, I would like to argue that baking in the equity component is a big part of this and focusing on the neediest first. Next slide. So just to, uh, to as a segue to, to, um, to talking a little bit about COVID and the challenges right now, as I said, when you open the doors uh, in, a, in a sincere manner of a clinical facility in a clinical desert, meaning without the staff subspace systems, uh, you, you, you're going to see a lot of patients with cancer. The same sort of pessimism that I discussed yesterday was expressed abundantly among policymakers, officials, uh, officials who should have known better and whose job it was to think, how can we deal with non-communicable diseases? Many cancers are communicable, of course, but how can we deal with what is now uh, a very clearly a ranking problem as deaths due to malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV uh, decline. So we were lucky to be in Rwanda uh, because uh, instead of being the house of no, and the no's are always the same, it's not cost effective, it's not feasible, it's not sustainable, it's not even prudent, it's foolish, you can't treat cancer in rural Haiti. All of these, uh, I've heard all of these things from health authorities, uh, usually not African health authorities, um, but uh, they are very reminiscent, of course, of objections to HIV treatment. So this is what the house of no looks like. People showing up, uh, you know, in a, and we even started calling this CIOS carried in on stretchers. But what, of course, cancer uh, Rwanda really needed was cancer care. Um, and at the time, there were no oncologists. There's still only one uh, in uh, at least in, in this part of Rwanda, but there were nurses, doctors, and community health workers and leaders. By the way, Agnes had then, by then, uh, because of her success with AIDS, become the Minister of Health of Rwanda, and where, where she probably is the longest serving uh, Minister of Health, five years. So, uh, with the support once again of the Ministry of Health, we decided to open a, a cancer center of excellence up here on this mountain. Uh, which uh, when we arrived had no hospital, but also no doctor, 
uh, no electricity and no running water. And that's where we built the hospital you saw on the first slide. And that's where we built the cancer center. This is one of my closest friends, Dr. Cipriani, who leads it uh, and opened this uh, not too long after opening the hospital. And I don't have to tell you what happened, you can guess. A flood of patients with advanced malignancies, but also that same flood of disapproval and pessimism on behalf of other people, uh, uh, again, usually uh, black and brown people. We also learned surprising things. I had been told that cervical cancer would be the ranking uh, malignant killer of women across this part of Africa. It isn't, it's, it was breast cancer, which is the number one on our list to this day. Yesterday, we, Dr. Cyprian and I were teaching and uh, one of a uh, uh, breast cancer survivor who's now 10 years out taught with us and she received her care as well. As far as I know, this is the only uh, cancer center anywhere in rural Africa. And again, the reason it's so busy is we removed the curse of user fees, helped with uh, transportation, et cetera. Next slide. And now uh, just to close, and this is all too familiar and our next speaker knows a lot more about it than I do because she's put a lot of heart into her COVID work over the last two years. There was no doubt from the beginning of the pandemic when you heard in the newspapers that, that it would be a great leveler, uh, we all knew that was false. Uh, and the numbers, uh, although uh, deeply disappointing, uh, are not surprising to anyone. Uh, uh, the, the risk, uh, not only of exposure, but the risk of not being able to protect your family members uh, and the, uh, from COVID um, uh, were obvious from the outset. I want to turn to the next slide, however, and, uh, and open this up uh, um, on a more optimistic note. Um, we knew already that in, in Africa, uh, we would face vaccine apartheid. Uh, because 99% of all vaccines used on this continent are imported. And it seemed very likely to us, given past experiences, uh, that there would not be a concerted effort to uh, amp up vaccine manufacturing in, uh, on this continent. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm very grateful to be, to be working here because the Rwandans had a very different idea of what should be done. Next slide. First of all, um, uh, as someone who has worked uh, in, in prisons and here, when we came here uh, 20 years ago, uh, the 70% of detainees uh, were there on genocide related charges. We also found that the government had uh, not only no objection to us working uh, to deliver medical services there, neither did our colleagues, many of them victims. Uh, uh, there was a lot of support for uh, work within the prisons. There was also a penal reform movement going on that's co here called Gachacha, uh, which I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was, I was skeptical that it, it would work. I was wrong again. Um, there, were, there were no retaliatory deaths as prisoners were moved out of incarceration uh, and into a collective form of uh, acknowledgement. Uh, and uh, I won't call it the, the equivalent of outpatient care, but it's impossible to manage epidemics uh, inside prisons if they're this crowded. And uh, the, the one that we worked in had 11,000 detainees. Um, and I've, I spoke yesterday already about experience in, uh, in Russian prisons. And uh, they were online to, because they were considered vulnerable populations um, to receive COVID vaccines. Uh, when we were arguing still about uh, community health workers uh, elsewhere, uh, the community health workers we work with, and we work with thousands, there are probably uh, 100,000 community health workers in Rwanda, 12 million population. Uh, they were on the, on the list. And I'll just say, having been on service here over the last month, I've seen many, many sick patients, in fact, only sick patients, uh, but all of them have received uh, uh, COVID vaccines and many of them boosters, especially if they have immunosuppression. Uh, so Rwanda, which is still, as I said, not one of the, is one of the poorer uh, nations in the world, uh, as far as I know, leads the list in terms of rates of coverage. And they also said that they would find a way to try and make vaccine and use these new technologies here on the continent. And, and this is just, I think, from 
yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, the arrival of a mRNA, the beginnings of an uh, mRNA uh, manufacturing solution to scale up vaccine production in, 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 on this continent. And again, I hope, uh, I, I had learned to bet on the commitment of the Rwandans to health equity, uh, which is why I'm sitting here today. Uh, next slide. And, uh, and last slide uh, at, at the University of Global Health Equity. Um, this is the hospital that I mentioned um, built uh, a dozen years ago, but now the third year medical students have uh, begun their uh, rotations in the hospital. Uh, and I, I hope this image leaves you with some of the hope uh, that I feel uh, um, in part from working in places where uh, who lives and who dies is always determined or too often determined by their social station, by racism, by histories of colonial rule, by gender inequality, and that this can be countered and has been and will be when we come together uh, to build a progressive uh, social justice movement uh, that reaches far from wherever we may live. Thank you very much for having me back. Thank you, Dr. Farmer, for your remarks. I would like to now introduce our discussant today, Dr. Kalama Okaina Niheu, who also gave the Oli to open our evening. She is a Kanaka Maoli family physician and until just recently, the Associate Medical Director for COVID Response at Lifelong Medical Care. She is the co-founder of the Standing Rock Healers Council and the Mauna Medic Healers Hui and physician for Unipa'a Na Huikalo, a Hawaii-wide coalition for the revitalization of native Hawaiian traditional kalo farming and food sovereignty. Over to you, Dr. Niheo. Lahaina, thank you so much. That's a uh... Always a hard act to follow with all of the history that um, Dr. Farmer provided for us, but also something that's important to follow through with. Uh, for us as Kanakamoli, we historically have looked at the Mo'okua how of our people and the genealogy uh, of uh, our peoples, honoring our ancestors and all those who came before, not just because they're ancestors, but because they're also um, people who had laid down the pathway uh, on which we will walk. Uh, and we in turn must then become the ancestors, the good ancestors ideally, that will lay down the pathway for our children and their children, children to come to lay down. And I believe that both social movements as well as uh, healing and medicine also have a mo'okuo, how or genealogy. And so providing this genealogy, you know, really Dr. Farmer uh, really opened up a lot of the discussion uh, globally about uh, what can and cannot be done. And like he had mentioned earlier, uh, when we talk about uh, health and we talk about health, health equity, we often are talking about uh, what, what we often talk about and focus on um, what is and is not possible. And a lot of times we focus a lot on uh, the things that we can't do. And I think that's far as any healer is out there, any physician, any um, provider, any um, nurse, any community health practitioner or social worker, the thing that breaks your heart is really the things when we are told that we cannot do. And I think that one of the things I always love about Dr. Farmer's work is that he always is fearless about saying, you know what, why can't we do this? What is stopping us from actually uh, shooting for something that is greater and more humane and more just, not just here, but for others around the world? And so putting it within the context of Hawaii. And one of the things that struck me and as I actually put a question in there that he actually addressed during his presentation was uh, what was the, what's the copay that folks are playing, paying at these hospitals in Rwanda? And one of the things that he brought up was one of the first things that they did was to get rid of um, very punitive medical bills. In the United States and Hawaii in particular, you see, you see 
supposedly heartwarming stories of a 10 year old who creates a GoFundMe for, for his mother dying from cancer, health illness, you know, HIV. People paint that as something that is considered to be a, a heartwarming tale when in actuality, it's a horrible story. It's a terrible thing that a 10 year old has to go and ask other people who are also suffering to try and pay for their mother when as a child, they shouldn't be having to worry about that kind of situation. The success of the vaccination program and the HIV treatment that you see in places like Rwanda is in large part because the doors were thrown wide open. Baking in the message of equity is essential to reaching all equally. The big reason why I decided to take on the role of the uh, COVID uh, Associate Medical Director of COVID Providers at Lifelong is because I knew at that time, uh, because of the own history of our own people, was that uh, when it came to infectious diseases, our people weren't genetically predisposed to suffering more from infectious diseases, but the vulnerable, the poor, the more marginalized are always going to be the ones that pay the most. And because of that, I wanted to step up to take care of not just my own peoples, but my indigenous allies throughout the world, as well as uh, our uh, to be a, an ally to the black folks, both in my community and beyond, uh, who are also experiencing the same type of worry and concern about, will they be experimented on? Will they be treated like human beings? Or will they be discarded or utilized as guinea pigs? And these stories they talk about with the Tuskegee syphilis study, by focusing only on that, something that happened many decades ago, it invalidates and it and you and it, it gaslights basically the fact that at this point, at this day, there are still involuntary uh, surgeries occurring in incarceration sites. There's still sexual abuse cases that are happening in communities by healthcare professionals today, particularly in vulnerable communities. And it obscures the fact that why are we having in the, the wealthiest country in the world, how is some, a place, a country like Rwanda providing more excellent and equitable access to healthcare than places like Hawaii or California? So there is a vaccine apartheid that is happening globally, and we have to respect the fact that that's happening, and that's still that's happening today. And that's part of the, the suspicion that you know it might it might not give they might not be implanting a microchip inside of you with these vaccines, but they are certainly making money off of our suffering and 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 our our ill health. So when we look at these situations, particularly now moving next into these oral medications, you know, Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Evusheld, how accessible will people be able to get these types of medications? And part of the reason why people don't, aren't willing to get vaccines is because we've really yielded the field about having that accompaniment in our communities. That for decades, I've been trying to fight in our communities the misinformation about vaccines, but we were asking them to come to our spaces, to come to our ivory towers, to humble themselves and subjugate themselves to potentially putting their family under deep and crippling poverty in order to even get basic advice, to even be aware that these resources are then available to our communities. So here we are finally in the space where we're understanding that if not everyone gets treated Pandemics happen, pandemics are prolonged, and deaths increase. And it's not just with COVID. We need to start looking at how they're looking at things in Rwanda. We should be inspired by the role of the healthcare workers there. We should have healthcare workers going house to house into the community. We should have universal healthcare. 
we should have a health system that is worthy of trust. How can people look at leaders in our government and say, see them saying that you can trust us on one hand and then still having the same people, you know, who we've been telling for decades that the Red Hill fuel tank is leaking into our aquifer system, endangering the water for all of our generations to come on the island of Oahu. We've been saying for decades that this is a real issue, that the heavy military presence really often does not provide our people the voice. Why aren't they providing the support in health systems when they are creating such damage ecologically to our ecosystems? Why aren't they helping participate and supporting the health care and wellness of our people? And why would we expect our people to believe those same voices when they say, trust us, take this medicine, inject this into your arm? But I still think with all of you here, there's enough of us here to believe that this is very possible. It's very possible because right now, 50% of all healthcare dollars in the United States simply goes to figure out who pays. And ultimately the people that pay are the people of our community. And now with situations like a pandemic, all of us will pay. All of us are alone and lonely. And now is the time to envision and dream of a time when we are united together and, and healed and whole. Mahalo nui. Thank you, Dr. Nihau. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, this one, I believe, is directed to Dr. Farmer. Let's see here. Jan Brunson, anthro anthropology professor at UH Manoa asks, how do you reconcile signing a statement of support for a colleague accused of sexual harassment with the values of social justice? When you signed that letter of support, did you not realize you'd send a clear message to graduate students that it is not safe to come forward with such information against powerful people? Do you intend to address with a public statement the uproar in the academic community that followed news of your support of a colleague accused of sexual harassment, and moreover, to reassure graduate students that their complaints of sexual harassment will be taken seriously? Well, um, first of all, um, I, I want to say that I don't think that I can reconcile that. I think it was an error. Uh, and, uh, um, and so I agree with Dr. Brunson. And, uh, and I think uh, saying that uh, it, it may, may well, and publicly as I have, um, uh, may well be, uh, I, to me, it feels insufficient. I said that, that as well. Um, and I don't really, unless, unless uh, I wouldn't want to sound like I was defending myself uh, by saying that the topic at hand was about uh, graduate student advising and a, a request for transparency in, in, in the process. Um, uh, but I'm particularly uh, uh, saddened and again, uh, and apologetic because uh, what I later learned, uh, uh, which by which time I had removed, as had I think most of our other colleagues, their names from that letter, um, that one of the women involved in the suit is someone who I, I respect greatly and have taught with. Um, and so, uh, in fact, I, I, I agree with the with the critique. I, I don't I don't feel that those two things can be reconciled. And so, I think it's better just to say. Uh, I made a mistake and I'm very sorry about it. Thank you. Uh, next uh, question is, is from uh, Anne Wright, uh, a former officer in the military who uh, is um, an activist against uh, the excesses of the military uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, she asks, with all the violence in Haiti, is the hospital you helped establish still able to function? Um, well, it, 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 first of all, there, there are 12 hospitals um, and because Partners in Health is, is, uh, is, is built the way it is, 
Um, I'm happy to tell you the answer is yes. Um, there are over 7,000 people working in, uh, in Partners in Health in Haiti, and they're, and they're really all Haitians, right? And so although we've had many problems, the same ones that you've read about, kidnapping, um, uh, the events uh, that followed the assassination of the president last summer, the earthquake, uh, in spite of that, my Haitian colleagues um, are running uh, what is probably the largest trauma center in the country, or the, the largest site of training of subspecialty nurses and physicians. Um, the numbers that I can see online because they have an electronic medical rec register suggest that they're seeing uh, thousands of people a day. Again, again, many of them critically ill and injured. We're also, I say we, uh, because I'm so proud to have been involved with them for so long, the National Referral Center uh, for the Treatment of COVID. So we're receiving uh, patients from all over the country, most of them critically ill because uh, we're one of the few places that can intubate patients and has an ICU. Again, this really is related to that same sort of uh, dismissive uh, what, what you know, in anthropology you might call socialization for scarcity on behalf of other people. And, and again, that usually black and brown people uh, where it can't be done, you can't have ventilatory support, you can't have an ICU in a place like rural Haiti. Um, my Haitian colleagues have proven this true, untrue again and again. And if, if there's one team uh, at Partners in Health that I'm proud of most, uh, it's, it's our Haitian colleagues. Um, they show up for work every day. And, and again, we've had a lot of uh, uh, losses. Um, but I would also note that when you're not involved in a post-colonial control over care model and clearly committed to caregiving, you know, uh, as we just heard in the, in, you know, in the Hawaii example, uh, you tend to be protected by the communities that surround you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the hospitals are also uh, uh, strongly supported by the communities they serve uh, and are open and functioning uh, and indeed growing. You know, uh, yesterday, uh, for example, uh, in Mirbalé, which is in central Haiti, not far from that place that I showed you, um, we're trading telepathology results with Rwanda. Um, so we can actually... Uh, and Haiti, Haiti has more clinical capacity uh, than we, we do here. And I would just add for the person who asked the question about Haitian uh, deportees, uh, we're pretty lucky in the United States uh, uh, if we can say that 15% of, of black doctors in the United States are Haitian. Uh, many of the, our leaders in Haiti have been working in New York or France or somewhere else, and they came back uh, to serve in Haiti when they had the adequate staff stuff, space systems and support. Thank you. Uh, this question from a viewer who is a resident of Waipahu um, on Oahu here. Uh, here she asks, what can we learn from your efforts to improve and expand care in the world's poorest places? that can be applied to places like Hawaii. Um, perhaps uh, Dr. Uh, Farmer, you could try that and, and maybe Kalama could chime in too. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, let, let, let Kalama go first, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm getting excited by the question, that's all. Well, I, I think that the fact that they're, I think that it's really the, a healthcare system that is, uh, we need to have healthcare systems that's very from the ground up that people are very much uh, involved with. I feel I, there's, Hawaii is identified as having a kind of a universal healthcare system because of our Quest um, healthcare system. Uh, and I think that that's something that's a bit of a misnomer. I think it has, provides a lot of a social safety net, uh, but currently your healthcare is still very much tied to uh, your employment. And your employment uh, is, you know, there's a, there, there is a class structure towards healthcare that exists in Hawaii uh, that we really need to abolish. We need to have a healthcare system that everybody has access to, and we're not afraid of accessing it. And I think that that's something that these 
right now, just because we have Quest, and I think it's still, it's very robust. It's a much more powerful than they have in other uh, states in the United States. However, I think it needs to be a lot stronger. I think we have to feel outraged that there are people who have one type of health insurance and can only ask at certain places um, in supposedly a civilized state. Uh, and But we feel like they are, uh, they, they aren't worthy of getting excellent care just because they're poorer. That if you don't behave and don't have a good job, that you, uh, you should be happy with less. You know, I just, I just want to add, um, Massachusetts is one of the wealthiest states in the nation. I, um, it also uh, could hardly be described as a medical desert although uh, I do believe we should reconsider that given the weakness of the public health investments. But uh, my colleagues at, at Partners in Health and, and Harvard, you know, um, and, the, and the teaching hospitals, uh, you know, my day job, as opposed to volunteer work, uh, were invited um, by the governor of Massachusetts to help lead the uh, contact tracing program early in the in the pandemic. Now we always knew that we would want it to be an accompaniment program, you know, uh, uh, along the lines of the work that Kala has been doing, um, and not just on COVID. We we always knew that that was how the the trainings went, and I you know I did not play a, a, a role in this except as a cheerleader and got to meet people and 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 learn from them. But we also uh, found out something that I found shocking. Uh, you know, if, if that fifth S, staff stuff space systems, uh, the fifth S is to support, you know, uh, the, the message that we were trying to give is, this is not control over care, you know, trying to surveil, it's trying to protect families and help them get through this. What is it that you need? Uh, and the, I don't really, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that 100,000 uh, people uh, uh, were involved in an informal study, and uh, you know that's a lot of people who did say yes, we do need help. And 80% of the of those families, their number one problem was food insecurity in Massachusetts. So yes, there were problems with rent. Yes, there were problems with the lack of, especially you know, as Kala says, especially the unevenness of uh, uh, insurance programs, even in a place where you know there's uh, you know mandatory health insurance, uh, one of their first states to have that. There were those problems. And, and, and then as everyone knows, uh, a lot of patients who needed care for other problems, uh, problems other than uh, uh, COVID, and I'm particularly thinking about mental illness, uh, diabetes, malignancy, that whole long list uh, of the kind of problems that uh, you both face, uh, you know, address in your clinical practice did not receive that care. And if I could be just, I know I'm bragging about Rwanda, but during COVID where there was an extreme lockdown, uh, one of the biggest questions for my colleagues uh, across the way here was what do we do about our cancer patients? In fact, many of them come from other countries, neighboring countries, Burundi, I can see Uganda from here, right? Uh, Tanzania. And again, why would they come from countries like Tanzania, which is wealthier than Rwanda probably, certainly Kenya is, is again, the user fees and the, and the roadblocks. So there was a great concern among my colleagues here about what are we gonna do um, uh, to make sure we get either chemo to the patients or the patients who need IV uh, chemo here uh, or, or in other countries. And uh, I mean, I can't help but say it, uh, within 48 hours, uh, of contacting a drone company, you know, I, when I hear drone, I think bad things. Um, uh, we were delivering uh, uh, oral chemotherapies uh, to patients right near their homes. Uh, uh, that's here in Rwanda, uh, and that still goes on today. Every every usually uh, at night, uh, what I when I see a drone, it's delivering blood, right? But it can also deliver um, medications as well. When, when an effort to get medications to neighboring Burundi, a diplomatic effort, and this is, you know, my, my colleagues, not diplomats, trying to work through ministers of health. When that didn't work, they, they, they kept at it and worked with a, a, 
uh, Cancer Survivor Association or Cancer Supper Association in the capital of Burundi and used DHL to get medications there. All of the, during the lockdown, all of the, the vehicles in the, in the fleet, ambulances, uh, jeeps were reassigned to find these patients uh, and uh, Partners in Health had, uh, uh, you know, laissez passer, we could, we could uh, travel, the police supported it. We even worked with the military hospital to move one of our cancer uh, treatment centers, centers into the capital city there in the, in the military hospital. So I'm just saying that kind of can-do attitude is what Kala and I are both calling for, uh, saying, is this going to be the house of yes or the house of no? And uh, I, I know we could have done better. Obviously, we did uniquely poorly as a nation, the United States, and that's why we lost friends, family, and patients. Uh, but again, I, I, I hope we can take heart uh, by some of, with some of these examples. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. We, we have uh, lots of other questions, but uh, unfortunately, I, I think we're, we're out of time here. I, I know you have another commitment uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, uh, Dr. Niheo, would you like to make any final final comments? Sure, is my um, mic on? I'm having, there you go. Uh, yes, I think that one of the things that we need to, um, I think, understand is that the pandemic has made us realize that, that when we have vulnerabilities, we all suffer, that people I thought that, you know, there's, Everybody's in the same boat, but then some people have yachts and some people have fishing um, ferries. And so, you know, I think that it's, but it's not just about being that boat that we're in like a river together. And if we're working together, there's detritus and debris and there's uh, rocky areas that if we just worry about our own little ship, we're going to have problems. And so if we can learn from each other and be inspired by each other, but most importantly, act. Uh, create systems of health, can create systems of access, and, and not and not stop ourselves to thinking that this is not possible. To actually be like, hey, you know what, you know the what's not possible is us, is us to live um, without equity, without justice, and without con connection globally to each other, um, and to recognize the humanity in all of us. Thank you, Doctor Nehu. So I, I'm going to go over some acknowledgments, but um, uh, Dr. Niheu and Dr. Farmer, uh, please feel free to turn your cameras off and, and mute. Uh, thank you. So uh, the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series is a joint venture of the Hawaii Community Foundation, Kamehameha Schools, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The lead sponsors of this evening's event is the John A. Burns School of Medicine's Office of Global Health and International Medicine with support from the Noguchi Medical Research Institute. Co-sponsors of this event and the series include the Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work, Office of Public Health Studies, and the Queen's Health System. Thank you to all for joining us this evening and um, have a good evening. Take care now. <laughs>